Yeah, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David. I run a mortgage broking business called Atelier Wealth, where we specialize in helping property investors start out and scale up their property portfolio. As part of that journey, when you're starting out, or maybe as you're going through to this next level of property ownership and investment, uh, there starts to become a little bit of internal chatter, whether it's kind of, I don't know how we do it, who's been there that's uh, done that before us, and how do we get access to people that are willing to share their journey? And that's one thing that I'm really excited that we get this opportunity through our podcast to get access to people that are willing to share their journey, open their um, open their brain and give us as much insight and knowledge as possible. And Matt from Property Resource Shop, I want to say welcome onto the show and it's great to have you with us, mate. Mate, thanks for having me here, Aaron. Pleasure. And you're coming to us all the way from a beautiful part on the Sunshine Coast up in Budrum. Um, mate, welcome. How's life treating up there? Mate, it's pretty nice up here. Um, sun's out, surf's up. So, uh, yeah, we try and um, make the most of it and not take, uh, take it for granted. Yeah, I can imagine. It's a mate, beautiful spot. I think we're very blessed not only to call Australia home, but some wonderful parts inside this country uh, where I think we get access to some of the best real estate in the, in this country, really, isn't it? Along the, along that's, the that's part of the bonus as well, yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it, mate? And uh, I guess it's probably full circle that how you've ended up in such a beautiful part because having read your story and it's it's quite openly documented about your story and your journey, I think that's one real um that's one real area that we want to have a chat about. So when I'm introducing a guest, I start with the three P's. So a bit about yourself personally, a bit about yourself professionally, and then your property journey. If you can, if you can share with us as well, please, mate. Yeah, yeah. Gee, personally, it's been quite a ride the last um, fifteen to maybe closer to twenty years now. Um, I was working as a theatre technician all those years ago. That was my career, I suppose, just travelling around, yeah. doing the lighting for for different shows across the place, which is a lot of fun. Um, uh, but it had its uh, at its time, and uh, as I got into my 30s, I started to think about uh, family and what other ways could I earn income? Um, how do I get my time back? Um, probably very similar questions to a lot of people. Mm. Um, so from there, yeah, that sort of took me into the, the property space. But yeah, personally, grew up in Melbourne, um, moved up to the northern New South Wales uh, when I was about 13, um, went to school there and on the Gold Coast. Um, Spent some time there and then moved to Mackay for a little while. Did a fair bit of traveling overseas to Europe and Africa and India, Nepal. So lo- love the travel stuff. Um, and then uh, started to settle down. Like I said, once I um, got into my 30s, not settled down, but just started to rethink things a little bit. You go, hang on, what are we doing all this for? Um, what's what's the job for and uh, what are we trying to achieve here? So it took me a while to, to catch on to all of that. I hadn't read any personal growth books or property books or, or wealth creation books at that point. Yeah. Um, just was happy to swap my time for money. Uh, but yeah, I guess when you start a family, you start to think differently and uh, a bit less selfishly mm-hmm. and wonder, okay, what are the other ways of doing this? There's other people obviously making it work. Um, and that's where the where it all sort of started for me and went on a completely different trajectory um, into the, the property space. That really is that penny drop moment for a lot of people, isn't it? I think when either you get married uh, or you start to think about family, um, you're almost yeah. a little bit uh, introspective and you go, well, hang on, uh, how is this going to play out for me? Because if you want to be a present parent, present partner or a spouse, for example, be the best be, be the best version of yourself, quite often you know, work will get in the way of that or I guess your own limitations and something you've touched on there is um, some of the deep work on yourself, self uh, improvement and going on that journey yeah. in yourself. So take me through what what have you done in the way of self development and investing into yourself as well, please, Matt. Yeah, yeah, that's um probably the the craziest part, I suppose, and the, but the most important part. So it's good to start there. I think um, I guess that for me it was about um, the, the snap point was around time. So swapping money for time and mm-hmm. asking for holidays and you know having to put a form in and beg the boss and and work overtime and not get paid for it. all those things. It was, I was enjoying my job at the time, but then I started to fade out a little bit. And that's where I was starting to look at, okay, how much annual leave do, do I have? How much time do I have to work to get uh, annual leave? And it was something like 40 hours to get three hours off or whatever it is. And, and that's when it sort of snapped and went, wow, okay, I've got to work a whole week to get three hours off. And that was the light bulb moment sort of thing. Of, I, I don't like that anymore. There's got to be a better way than that. And I could see the people in front of me that were in the job and, you know, I just didn't like what I saw, you know, ahead of me. 
Um, so yeah, I, I got into to property, um, and that was the point where I did a few deals, and they didn't quite work out, or they did work, but not to the sort of success I expected. Okay. And I was very much earning the same amount of money as I was in a job, and, and that's when I, I guess, it was another snap point of well, why am I bothering? You know, why am I putting blood, sweat, and tears into these renos and subdivisions? And, and risk and debt um, and time when I could just show up at work and get paid, you know. So um, that was when the realisation of, uh, of personal growth had to come into it. Uh, and I was told that when I first started out by, by Steve McKnight, he said, mate, the, the personal development goes hand in hand with the property journey. And I was very uh, dismissive, mm-hmm. you know, like whatever. I'm, I'm pretty confident. I can, I can I know how things work. Just show me the numbers, show me the deals. Let's get this rolling. Um, but there was some some deep-seated stuff there that I had to address around um, self-worth, um, my relationship with money, mm. uh, and, and those things that were just limiting beliefs that were holding me back. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I uh, ended up getting a, a life coach who I still work with today, you know, 15 years on, um, and she was very good at um, pushing the buttons and, and nothing too drastic. You know, I had a lovely childhood, great parents, but there was just some things that I picked up along the way that didn't serve me anymore, and she was able to unlock that a little bit uh and at the time i just figured all right 12 months personal growth let's focus on that and uh tick that box and then i'll be i'll be personally developed and i can go and do deals and everything will be fine you know uh but it was very much a a case of wow this is a lifelong journey you know mm-hmm. this is now something you got to work on all the time and and these days it's more of a um a pleasure you know rather than trying to run away from it or procrastinate about it it's a case of, wow, well, here's, here's an opportunity to grow uh, and now I have the tools to do that, um, let, let's go get it. You know, whereas before it was a case of, well, it's somebody else's fault or I don't want to address that sort of stuff. And so I really took a coach to, to pull that out of me um, and then I've continued to layer on from there and, you know, it just becomes, like I said, a lifelong journey uh, in trying to help yourself, help others, your loved ones uh, to, to go through that process, you know, when you're ready. Yeah. Something you mentioned before was look, I was doing a few projects, the renovations, the sub, you know, subdivisions, and it sounds like you maybe broke even, learned a few lessons along the way. Having reflected on what you did then versus what you do now, what are some of those insights that you've kind of carried from that experience? Do you think, Matt? Yeah, leverage is the biggest one. Leverage. Mm-hmm. So in the beginning, I was really trying to do it all myself. Um, so I came from a role that was managing a lot of people um, and uh, a lot of stress. So I was very happy to just do everything myself. I didn't want to borrow anyone. But I actually had a, a transitional job in between that, which was being a postie. Yeah. Uh, and I did that for a couple of years, which was, which was awesome. You know, it was like cruising around on the CT-110, you know, <laughs> delivering mail, no stress. Uh, and it was a great moment where I could sort of just shut everything off and focus on property uh, yeah. and myself, but still earn a little bit of money, a very small amount of money, but enough to get me through. Um, and, yeah, it was... After that, that I, that I realised I was just I was just uh, burning myself out, you know. So I was the one on site painting the walls and installing kitchens and, oh, right. you know, just crazy stuff, you know, that probably shouldn't have been doing. Um, mm-hmm. But I just felt like, oh, if I do this, I'm saving money, you know, and I'll make a bigger profit. And just hadn't worked out the leverage side of things. Um, so that went on for a few, three or four deals. Uh, it took me a while to sort of cut that full belt off and realize, hey, this isn't my expertise. It's about finding the deals and getting them funded rather than being on the ground. So um, once I worked that out, it became a lot better. Uh, I was able to um, scale it up a little bit. Uh, But the key thing was, yeah, the leverage and and joint venturing with other people. So uh, whether they found the deal, whether they brought the funds and and vice versa, we would collaborate. Uh, And so every deal since that point has been a collaboration of some sort, whether it's been me funding another deal, somebody else is funding mine, sharing skills, resources. Um, it's, a, it's a far more lucrative approach, uh, but far more pleasurable as well. You know, it's a pretty lonely game doing this alone by yourself. If you can bring in good people uh, that have integrity with, with a win-win outcome, um, it becomes you know, a, a, great, a great thing, you know, and getting those bits right. Yeah. Uh, not as easy as it sounds, but uh, if you can have that focus in the beginning, you can do so much more. I'm glad you said it's not as easy as it sounds because that's one, I guess, one of the hurdles that when we say, like, say, co-investing or a JV, for example, 
the first mm. thing that I think a lot of people's mind goes to is what happens when things go wrong? And I'm sure you've yeah. crossed that bridge and, and on your own pathway, maybe things have gone wrong uh, as well. Yep. How does how does someone mentally get past that? Or is that a legal way to get past? Or is there uh, yeah. we've got a few projects to be in bed together with someone before we we pull the trigger, for example? What, what's been your experience yep. with joints? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And they're valid fears. You know, it's it's real for people. Um, it comes back to, to mindset in the end and, and having knowledge. I mean, I, I put a resource together back in 2015 when we were in France. I had some spare time and I, I, I put together something that explained how to actually do joint ventures, you know, from a theory point of view because it was exactly what we'd been doing. So I just I put it together. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, well, I, this is the answer for everyone. You know, this is how you move forward in property. No matter if you, you don't have a job, you don't have cash, you don't have skills, here's how you actually move forward. And so I put it together and launched it to, to my um, community and it was embraced and um, everyone loved it. But what I found was most people weren't implementing the strategies, you know, because it was too scary. And that's something that I, I overlooked. I just figured, well, here's, here's how you do it, go and do it. And, uh, and it wasn't supposed to be just a, you know, another book or a trophy you put on your shelf it was something that I wanted people to actually embrace and do something with and make money with. Um, so, yeah, we ended up um, turning it into an event and holding people's hands and taking them through it more personally. But I think the key of going through that whole process was, first of all, education. That's the basis of everything, just learning, okay, what are the, the ways of doing it? Um, then the mindset component. So what is your risk profile? Um what is your burning desire? How do you get over this fear and push past it? Because if that's going to hold you back and debilitate you, well, then it's not going to happen anyway. Mm. Um, so working on yourself in that space. Most importantly, having good people around you, um, really vetting people properly, um, not just going into a deal because they've got the deal, you've got the money, or we're best mates and let's go and make a million bucks together. It's about doing the due diligence on the people involved even more so than the deal itself, from my experience. Um, obviously, the deal's got to stack up and it's got to get funded, um, but it's even more important to have a process of understanding the other people involved and how they react under different circumstances, particularly stressful ones or where there's conflict, um, because every project has its challenges and curveballs. There's going to be some stress. Um, so knowing that you're working with somebody that... Um, has that same win-win approach, that same integrity. Uh, they're not trying to um, get a, a win-lose or trying to rip anybody off. They've got really good intentions. Yeah. Uh, and choosing well in the first place with that side of things is just is just critical. And then there's the logistics to it, obviously, of just making sure that you've got complementary skills and resources. It's not, not just everyone with, with money going into the deal. Someone's got to have the deal. Someone's got to have the skills. Someone's got to have the funding uh, and putting that together in a collaborative effect with the right intentions. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Cause I think the traditional co like co um, purchases or joint ventures, two friends or siblings, for example, and it's some that you, you may know, but like you're saying, how do they react when things go off the rails for a little bit? And quite often I say to people, I'm like, do you value the friendship more or do you want the outcome? And yeah, yeah I think we've got to be open about the risk, but also very clear about there's rewards to be had here. So like anything, there's, you've got to go through a little bit of pain sometimes to get to the other side. Mm -hmm. And you've probably seen this. So um, something you've touched on very briefly was the community. So take me through how have you, how did this get initiated in terms of starting? Because you start with, I'm mm -hmm. sure, very small and out snowboard into a larger community. So take us, yeah. through, I guess, the idea with, with community building as well. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's been a phenomenal journey. I mean, and it was never set up to be any sort of business structure, mm. joint venturing, anything like that. It was really just a love gig in the beginning where I was starting out in property. I needed support. I wanted to share the journey with others. Um, so it was literally 10 of us that got together. And, and it doesn't have to be 10 people. It could be one person where you're just together on the same journey, helping each other, um, which is exactly what it was. We'd go out to out to dinner once a month and talk about property, share referrals, um, just support, you know, because you don't always get that from your friends or family. They sometimes trying to might want to drag you down because of their own limiting beliefs. So getting around others that are going to lift you up is really important. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, that group, because we kept that 
that level of integrity, that purpose around what we were doing at the top of the top of the list as it as it evolved. You know, so it went from 10, you know, to 100. You know, we're squeezing 50, 60 people into a lounge room at one point um, talking about property and it just kind of got a little bit out of control um, to the point where I nearly gave it up because we were putting a lot of effort into keeping this running. I had to hire a venue and get yeah. speakers and um, I was not getting paid for it and I was thinking, well, hang on, this is <laughs> holding me back in other ways. So yeah. what, what am I doing this for? I'm, I'm so glad I didn't though because it, it just meant we had to lift our game as well. Uh, and as as it grew, we we grew with it, you know, and we embraced that, um, structured it a bit better. Where there was, you know, we have a venue, we have sponsors, um, we have good content, but the whole lounge room feel, you know, hasn't changed over the fifteen years. Yes, we get there's probably seven, ten thousand in the group now. Um, we get about a hundred come along every month, but it's still that same feel. You know, it's not a pitch fest or there's no hidden agendas it's literally come along this is some good content um there's some people that share their 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 projects and case studies and just be around others that are um are wanting to learn you know and and all skill levels are in the room you know there's some full-time property developers there people doing some commercial stuff there's renos and subdivisions happening and there's people that have just turned up for the first time and they have done nothing haven't even bought their own home they're just know they want to get into property and they just figure that was a good place to start, which it is, you know, just being around others that are going to you know, support you in that journey. Um, so we've just continued to foster that community um, and we still run it because we get the same benefit. You know, we, we show up every month and, and, and I facilitate it and, and I network like everybody else, um, but we get to meet new people. We get to see deals getting done. We get to be a part of opportunities that are there. Um, that's why we, we continue to show up for the same reason as everyone else. Uh, and then that community is kind of um, refined itself into other um, more uh, boutique events around joint venturing, which are a lot smaller, but they're a lot more focused um, around having people that are intentional about what they're doing. Whereas the, the Brisbane Property Networking Group is very much a, a public group. You know, anyone can come along and we're going to be talking about property, um, but you're also going to be, looked after on the night you know there's integrity there um people often walk away have, having that sense of comfort that they haven't been hoodwinked in any way it's just good people wanting to help each other and, and someone called it the aa for the property investors um a couple of months ago you know just a support group <laughs> that's fine that's uh and that's what i think it's uh what they say uh a rising tide you know rising tide lifts all boats for example so you want to be around that level of community iron sharp and iron so a couple of other things come to mind yeah. where I'm like, there's no agenda nothing's being sold for example um but that peer-to-peer -peer type learning and sharing is probably where a lot of investors gain that level of confidence because they're speaking the language amongst each other they can feel the pain amongst each other they can how did you do that and everyone's willing to share so it's not like there's mm -hmm. there's anyone that's closed off to they want to see each other do well is the bottom yeah line. that's right Oh, it's, it's very um, it's very uplifting, inspiring. When like I get members of the group to actually present their projects, um, and sometimes there's a couple that have had losses. Yeah. you know where someone's actually got up, been really vulnerable, and said, "Yep, stuff this one up." You know, the market caught me out. Interest rates went up. Um, I've decided to to swallow the the bitter pill and take a loss so I can move on to the next thing. Yeah. Massive learnings for people watching that. You know, um, and then there's others that have that have done some amazing stuff and been very inspiring. So. And even the journey's gone for so long now, there's people that are have been in the room and then three, four, five years later, they're the ones at the front presenting their projects. And, and they've had that initial inspiration from just being in the room, seeing someone else present yeah. and go, wow, okay. that's Because it's done very, in layman's terms, it's not complicated stuff. You know, it's someone renovating a house, it's someone subdividing into two and selling them both off for profit. There's other more advanced strategies there, but, Really, it's very um, simple stuff to follow, and yeah. people feel like they can they can do it, and and hopefully that's what happens. They they become inspired and then um, do that themselves, and and then come back and, and share it with the group. Yeah, nice one. Do you have a bit of a guide, say, for someone that's first time? Let's uh, a common example is we've got a couple that's got they bought their home. There's equity in it now. They're looking for their first maybe first investment property or their first project, and you know incomes are quite good. So borrowing capacity is there. Where 
and again, this is not intended to give advice. This conversation is generally in nature, but what's some of the examples yeah. that you've had with people that have gone on to, just to kind of dip their toe in the water or start with their first project as well? What would that typically look like? Yeah. Yeah. So it starts with firstly understanding what are you trying to get out of this? You know, are you, are you trying to build a portfolio with passive income? Are you trying to do some deals that provide some, some chunk uh, cash for whatever you need to purchase or pay debt down or whatever it is? So getting clear on that first, I think it's really important because that'll determine the strategy. Um, it, whether you're interested, you know, maybe it's just you want to buy and hold strategy and, and that's all you want to focus on. That's okay. I guess we don't focus on that a lot because we're more doing active uh, approaches. But I would kind of say um, work out the resources you've got first and where do you want to go? Do you want to do your own projects? Great, let's get clarity on that first. If you don't, cool, there's other options that you can buy and hold and, and build a portfolio in that way. If yeah. you want to be more active and learn this sort of stuff, um, I, I'd encourage people to be, if you've got equity or you've got cash, to be able to to fund somebody else's deal that's doing what you want to do. Because uh, I kind of see that as a um, as a mini mentorship, you know, where you're actually part of somebody else's project. If you're starting out and you're wanting to do a subdivision, there's, it's not rocket science, but it takes time to find the right deal and, and get the consultants together and implement the strategy. And there's a lot of risk along the way that you've got to mitigate. Um, so by piggybacking onto someone else, I think it's really valuable as long as it's the right people, the right project, and you can bring something to the table. Um, it might be a couple of hundred in, in equity or cash that you have, you know, instead of going and buying your own property or doing your own deal, maybe just make some return on that capital, but also learn, you know, from somebody else that's actually more proficient at it. And not only learn, but just be a part of it, you know, because if you're bringing something to the table, you, you have the right to be um, saying it's yours as well. Yeah. yeah, nice one. And I, I, you, you nailed it. I was kind of that's what I was hoping the conversation would go, which is you, you quite often people jump to the property side. I'm like, well, what's the strategy and what are you actually looking for the outcome here? As opposed to, I think this is the site. I'm like, I think we've missed the point. We need to go upstream a little bit more and go, what what are you looking at? And why are you doing that, for example, as well, which I think you kind of touched on, which is great. Yeah, yeah, really important. And I skipped over that as well. I just got into projects. I did doing renos because that's all I could get my head around. I figured I was yeah. a little bit handy. And I just thought, let's just go and make some money, you know, with absolutely no idea of where I was going with it. Um, so, yeah, you do have to unravel it a bit and go, well, and I often ask people, you know, about what are you doing here? What, why property? You know, what support? I want to be financially free. Yeah, but why? Like, what's the next thing? Mm. You know, like I've been through a number of mini retirements sort of thing. You can only play golf so much and sip cocktails on the beach so much. You need some purpose around that. So if you're starting to think about that now, and it's not an easy question to answer, but if you're thinking about it, planting the seeds, it does set you on that trajectory around what strategy you need to be implementing and and how to make it easy for yourself. You know, it doesn't have to be difficult. Um, you can collaborate with good people out there um, and, and just find where you're trying to go with it because you'll have your niche in there somewhere. Um, but if you know what what the end game is for yourself and not comparing it to anybody else, you know, you're emotionally connected to that. Um, it's a lot. Uh, it's a lot simpler to get out of bed and, and give it a crack. Awesome. Something again. You just you, you glossed over before, which is I've spent some time in France, and I've read you know in your in your story <laughs> uh, that you spent. I was it like two and a half years in in France. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Something that a lot of people aspire to, which is, hey, can I? And I guess with COVID, be a digital nomad, for example, or just take some time out for myself and my family. Mm. So there's a few questions behind this is the how and and the what and and the where. So take us through yeah. that all kind of come about. Was that just like, hey, look, spur of the moment? Or was this intentional that you go, we actually want to pick up and, and move somewhere and, and experience life somewhere else as well? Yeah, it was, it was very intentional. Um, and it did come from, like most things, a snap point. Um, that that happened along the way. So we were doing deals. I was out on site a lot. Yeah, Every, everything was rolling really well. Um, building the community, joint venturing. You know, there was good cash flow. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of got to a point where it felt like it was a job again. You know, I was getting a little bit. Hang on, what are we doing here? I feel like I'm packing my lunch and on my shirt again to go to work. I don't like this feeling. Um, and so we just had to step back. And the kids were quite young then, and uh, we just 
took some time out to go, well, what do we want to do here? You know, and we always wanted to learn another language. That was something that my wife and I were very passionate about. Um, we'd both been to France separately before. Honestly, we could have gone anywhere, really. It was just that France seemed to be the place for us because we knew a bit of the language and um, we were both excited by it. Um, so, yeah, we, we chose to do that. And that decision then um, allowed us to, I suppose, give ourselves the permission to change what we were doing, you know, mm. not do the deal so actively anymore. You know, how can we do this more passively? Because every once we made the decision and bought the tickets, uh, there was probably 12 months of preparation in how do we how do we run the meetings from France? How do we continue to stay in the market from France? Uh, it forced me to be better at delegating and finding ways to do things more remotely. It's yeah. pretty easy these days after we've just had COVID, but back then it was 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 quite challenging. Yeah. Um, but we had this real clear purpose of what we wanted to do. We didn't quite know what it was going to look like. In the early days, it was just going to be 12 months. Um, I just had a bit of a buffer in the savings and we had money in projects that was providing passive income. So I guess we were going to make less money because we weren't as active in the deals, but we had enough to work with. Uh, and we just, yeah, we sold the cars, we sold the house, we were renting before we left, literally had four suitcases, flew into Paris, hired a car, and just figured, okay, we'll just drive around France and see where we're going to position ourselves. Yeah. And uh, once we got there, I think I underestimated how big France was because we were driving for a long time, <laughs> trying to work out where we were going to sit. And uh, it was probably about three months of just enjoying the country, but also in the back of my mind, hey, we've got to settle somewhere. We've got to get the kids in school. Yeah. Um, we really want to experience you know, something very local, you know, not – the only prerequisite was there was no, there shouldn't be any English speaking people there. So we weren't going to be in South France, it had to be somewhere where it was genuinely local. Um, yeah, we settled on this place in the middle of the Loire Valley, uh, a little country town with about 3,000 people, um, and just stumbled across it, felt right, met some really nice people there. And, and that was the key to it, really, that the network that we're exposed to uh, and how they helped us embed ourselves through finding somewhere to to rent and because it's a very different property market there. You don't just go in and rent something. Um, it's it's very clicky. Uh, no, there's not a lot of entrepreneurial stuff going on. Um, and then you've got the language barrier and all the logistics with it and then two little kids in the back seat, you know, that we're getting a bit sick of it all. Totally. Um, but, yeah, once we, once we found that place, it was everything just opened up. You know, we, we found a, a house that someone was actually in separation, so we were able to take their house, met the principal of the school, Met some friends who were in those sort of underground parties, you know, where you could see the real, what was really going on in the town. And, and that's what we wanted, you know. So from there, we ended up extending our stay. And, oh, look, we could have stayed there for five years, really. Um, but we also had a, an older son back home and we wanted to make sure he was okay. So we ended up cutting it short after two and a half years. But, uh, yeah, just completely changed our view of everything yeah, uh, and how – Time is so important and, and doing those things. And look, it's not like it cost a lot of money to do that either. You know, it was more about the choice. Yeah. Hey, we want to do this. You know, so let's find a way to do it. You know, not get caught up in we have to be in a nine to five or we have to keep doing deals and keep building wealth for retirement. Hang on, let's just enjoy the moment while we can. Uh, and that's really served us well, even when we've come back, just to choose deals based on our lifestyle, you know, not just about the money. Money, of course, the money is important. We want to make money and create wealth and passive income and, and all that. But there's another side to it as well where we want to live a life. Um, it's not about just getting 65 and retiring. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we bring that into all our decision-making. And, yeah, I dare say we'll be back in France at some point, <laughs> some point soon when the kids finish school, yeah. I love it. Uh, I mean, what I, what I love hearing about your story is the – similar chat with another guest that we've had recently, which is the investment people think they're investing into an asset, which is property. I'm like, you're investing into yourself, which that's paid yeah. for dividends, right? The return on investment. And then it's going, well, hang on, what are we actually doing here? To, we can have money in the bank, but if we're not living life and having these experiences, what are we acquiring? We're acquiring property, but we're not actually living life. And I think that's something that I really just love about your story, which is it's real, it's it's quite authentic in the way that hey we're just running our own race here we're not trying to compete, 
but we still mm. want to kind of build our wealth. And I think underlying all that is it's intergenerational wealth through property and your children yep. are the beneficiaries of you and your wife making smart, confident decisions that are going to change the entire trajectory for your kids' lives as well, which yeah. your, parent, your entire outlook changes going, this is not for me anymore. This is for my family. Yeah. And I think property, if you can unlock it, does a wonderful job in changing an entire family's wealth trajectory as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Even just them seeing that, like not, not the end result, but seeing the decisions you're making along the way that, hey, you can do it a different way. Yeah. You know, yes, do what we'll support whatever you want to do. You know, go to uni, become a doctor, become a real estate agent. I don't care as long as you're happy, yeah. but just know there's all these other avenues to explore, you know, and hopefully that that's rubbing off through osmosis with them as well, um, mm. as well as the benefits of, you know, having a property portfolio down the track. So, yeah, I think it's the reason for everything, you know, what you pass on to your kids and, and for yourself, like you say, investing in yourself and um, enjoying, we're here to enjoy ourselves. You know, we can get a little bit caught up in, in overachieving and depending on your personality, I've definitely burnt out a few times trying to do that. Um, but I think you hit the nail on the head with running your own race, you know, not comparing yourself to, oh, hang on, they're doing commercial or they're, I should be at that phase by now. You know, just hang on a minute, just bring it back to what you want and what you're happy with. Yeah. And, and that's okay. You know, that's, that's fine. Sage advice, mate. Thank you very much. And this is what I love about this opportunity, especially for our clients, is getting access to someone like yourself. They hear it from you in, in your words, and some people gravitate to that message and they'll hear from other people and they they resonate with their message as well. So I want to say thank you very much for being open and sharing. And um, I know that you've been on a few podcasts and I've, I've heard your story, which is why I was excited that you were happy to say yes and jump on here, which is the way that we can amplify someone's message and get out your message is going to inspire someone else. It's going to inspire someone else. And that that snowball effect is ultimately going to create better quality investors in the market, making good quality decisions. You and I, if we can help someone in some way, shape or form, it's even just through an off-the-cuff conversation with someone. It's like, hey, look, we've paid it forward in in that sense as well. So thank you very much. For yeah. No, my pleasure, mate. I'm always happy to do this sort of thing. If it can, The funny thing is you don't know where that inspiration is going to happen. You know, you're just dropping a pebble in the pond. And I often see it in our community, you know, years down the track where they've heard something and maybe not necessarily from me, but just they've been a part of it and it's spurred them to do something else or change their life or change the the, the scenarios that they have with yeah. it and, and create something more amazing. And then they then pass it on. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a good feeling, you know, where you can affect others like that. You know, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it keeps you, it keeps that purpose alive and keeps you getting up yeah. and doing it, you know, because you, you get to a point where you've got enough money. Okay. So there's got to be something else. And if you can add that value, yeah, I think, um, I think just that just keeps the, the whole wheel turning, you know, and if people want to embrace that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, mate. And just the conversation, uh, it's almost such great timing because the ex yes, there's I mean, this exact conversation with a new client going, okay, they they know they want to do a JV, and I think they're just so stuck in the the mechanics of it. Do we do it through a trust? Yep. Do we do it through a company? Do we do it through discretionary? Should it be you? And I'm like, I think we just need to yep. kind of go upstream a little bit more and go. We need to make sure that we're aligned. And I feel like this, like you're saying, if it can affect one person, I'm like, bang, straight away, I'm like, this episode is going to be perfect for them to have a listen to. They'll then. Yeah. I get access to, to your community. And just on that point, how does someone get access to say yourself or your community? What, what's the best way to be involved, Matt? Yeah. So we've got a few, the best thing is probably just go to our website, propertyresourceshop.com. Yep. Um, there's a whole bunch of great free content on there. Um, some downloads you can, you can get access to. There's more information about um, our property launch pad, which is the joint venture event that I touched on before. Yeah. Um, we've got a, a membership site with a whole lot of, online content that you can get access to there. Uh, and then also our, our networking group meetings. If you're in uh, Southeast Queensland, uh, you can come along to those uh, um, every month. Yeah. The membership site also allows you to access that uh, virtually. So we, we Facebook live every oh. event. So you can actually tap into it from, we have a lot of people from all over the country, even overseas that tap in live, which is great. And then we record it, send it out to you as well. So yeah, if you're not in Southeast Queensland, there's ways and means of connecting to the community. Yeah, sure. um, and yeah, just just reach out to me if anyone's got questions. I'm I'm always happy to to help, you know, um, and, and just keep people moving on that that path. 
Uh, if I can play a small part in that, then uh, it's my pleasure and my privilege, you know, to be able to do that. So yeah, propertyresourceshop.com is probably the best place. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks for sharing that. And yeah, I'd love to uh, include your resources. So include some of those uh, downloaders that you mentioned, access to to your Facebook and your and your um, online community as well, which we'll share in the show notes. And uh, if you've had got any questions for Matt, myself, for example, uh, drop us a line. We'll include our contact details uh, in the show link, uh, show notes below. Uh, and if you've got a review or you got some feedback on this episode, we'd love to hear that from you as well. And that's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. Until next time, take care.